Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ed Schlesinger. I'm the Benjamin T. Rome Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering, and it is truly my great pleasure to welcome you to the dedication of the Alton and Sandra Cleveland Professorship and installation of the inaugural recipient, Lauren Gardner. Thank you all for being here today to celebrate this very special occasion, and I'd like to offer a special welcome to Buddy and Sandy Cleveland, as well as their family and friends, to Lauren and her husband, Alex, and to all of the speakers in today's program. And in addition, we're very honored to have with us today President Daniels to join us uh, for this important celebration and recognition. So welcome. Uh, the foundation of any great university, the foundations are built by great acts of philanthropy. And among the gifts a university receives, none make a more profound or more permanent difference than the gift of an endowed professorship. It serves our mission of teaching, research, and service in an especially powerful and visible way, combining the permanence of endowment with what truly makes the university great, its ability to attract the best faculty minds it can identify anywhere in the world, to bring them to Hopkins and to ensure that they and their discipline will flourish when they arrive. The women and men who hold endowed chairs bring luster to the name of Johns Hopkins. They create some of our most important research and they frequently attract the brightest and most promising students, those who understandably want to work with acknowledged leaders in their fields. The dedication of endowed professorship is a particularly wonderful moment in the life of an institution. It allows us to recognize the generosity of our friends, as well as the distinguished career and great personal devotion of a particular faculty member. Lauren, a few people are going to speak on your behalf today, but let me be the first to officially say congratulations on this well-deserved honor. You have most definitely made an indelible mark on the world, and we are proud to have you as a member of the Whiting School family. And to you, Buddy and Sandy, thank you. We are so grateful for your generosity and commitment to the Whiting School over many years, and especially at this moment. Today, we honor you for creating the Alton and Sandra Cleveland Professorship. Now, I actually enjoy the pomp and circumstance, the traditions and the ritual of, uh, of academia. And so, because endowed professorships are held and administer, administered by the University Board of Trustees, professorships are formally presented to the university. So President Daniels, if you would please join me here at the podium. As Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering, I formally present to you as president of the Johns Hopkins University, the Alton and Sandra Cleveland Professorship. Thank you very much. Dean. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dean Schlesinger. Welcome, of course, to this wonderful, wonderful occasion for Dr. Lauren Gardner, for the Whiting School of Engineering, but in truth, for the entire Johns Hopkins University. And thank you, of course, first and foremost, to Buddy and Sandy Cleveland for making this amazing professorship possible. It's wonderful to be joined today by Lauren's loved ones, by Buddy and Sandy and their family, and of course, by so many friends and colleagues from across our university, including, of course, our Dean of the Whiting School, Beth Flower, Associate Vice Provost for Public Sector Innovation and co-founder for the Centers for Civic Impact, and Lori Graham uh, Brady, Associate Director of the Hopkins Extreme Materials Institute. And so without further ado, this is a crucial moment. It's not official until I uh, say these words. It is my great pleasure, Dean Ed, to accept the inaugural Elton and Sandra Cleveland professorship. It's now official and you can applaud. <laughs> Now, anyone, anyone who has spent any time with Lauren, especially in the past two years, knows how truly singularly devoted she is to her work. She is so singularly dedicated, in fact, that she can sometimes forget to pick up the phone. Uh, I learned about this, indeed, Lauren, firsthand in the early months of 2020 when you seemed to be distracted. 
I kept hearing about this project that was happening somewhere in the university, developed at Whiting, that was attracting the attention of hundreds or thousands, and increasingly the number started to mount millions of people practically overnight. And of course, um, I, hearing these rumors of this uh, little website, wanted to know more about it from the source, only to have the source send my calls straight to voicemail. Uh, but Lauren had a really good reason, a really, really good reason, though. That, of course, everyone knows. Uh, in January, she and one of her graduate students and Cheng Dong had pulled an all-nighter or two to create the iconic red and gray map that used public data to track a new virus that was then spreading through China. And of course, we know it was an immediate international sensation. And there was this incredible demand, in fact, a demand that kept, kept that simply keeping the map online was a Herculean effort for all of the university and that required the collective commitment of colleagues from across our university. And this was a true and amazing one university moment. And we know how the story ends, but with the support of the Sheridan libraries, with our applied physics lab and others, and guided always by Lauren's vision and values that this should be a quintessentially public and open resource. The site quickly became the go-to source for information on COVID-19 for millions of individuals, policymakers, and organizations. We know that since 2020, the site has informed the reopening of our cities, the ongoing success of our vaccinations or not, and our calculated risks of gathering safely with loved ones and even the ability to be in moments like this one together. So if there were ever a reason to dodge a call from an administrator, this was it. So um, again, it, um, it, is, it was truly amazing what you accomplished, Lauren, through this vision. And you know, and I've said on other occasions, you know, so much of our life as academic leaders, you're bringing, getting together with colleagues. I'm looking at Ben, you know, the dreaming that we've done around the O'Connor Center for Sustainability, Rosie, as we call it. But you're getting people together. We heard that people are interested in doing something and you're trying to help support them making something happen. You're bringing people together in the conversation. And then your job is to try and give life to those ideas, get flight to those ideas, get resources, get facilities, see if you can get funding lines, you know, get faculty, doctoral students, so forth. But um, there are these moments, and Lauren, yours was a perfect moment. When you understand your role as a university leader, whether it's a dean, a president, a provost, a department chair, your role is just simply to let people do what they want to do, to explore the things they want to do, to create the, um, to create the kind of projects, to take the risk that they want to take and you're just there to make sure that uh that the obstacles are removed and then amazing things happen and this was just the quintessential case for someone doing something that just occurred to them and being able somehow within the university find their way to do it and just to follow your personal instincts and it's it's really again a really important um enterprise that you led off that reminds us all what our obligations are as stewards of the university. And for that, I thank you for, um, for all that you've done. As you know, um, as much as Lauren's got a great deal of attention, understandably so, including that recognition from uh, Time Magazine that we are all so proud of, as much as she is known for this uh, map, there's so much more that she is about. And um, what's really striking is the extent to which her work really has shown on how, showing us all how we can imagine great things from data modeling and its capacity in a number of different policy contexts to address the most urgent crises of our moment with alacrity and with precision. A systems engineer to her core, Lauren can see elaborate interconnected systems, systems in which millions of disparate data points can somehow combine to reveal comprehensive patterns and possibilities that can allow us to make changes to adopt policies that will affect for the better the character of our lives. And nowhere, I think, is this clearer than in Lauren's work with Beth Flower. And Beth, it's great to see you here and our Centers for Civic Impact. Together, these two colleagues 
and others are building and expanding upon the foundational systems of the Coronavirus Resource Center to tackle a host of international disparities from education accessibility to climate change and sy systemic poverty in communities throughout the world. This professorship is an instrumental part of that work, equipping Lauren with the resources to harness data truly for the public good, a critical need that touches virtually every nook and cranny of our university. And of course, this would not have been possible without the extraordinary support of Betty and, Buddy and Sandy Cleveland. There are few people who better understand the enduring importance of Lauren's work than Buddy. A pioneer of engineering and construction modeling software, Buddy spent his career securing the infrastructure that keeps our society operating and connected. He knows intimately how industrial systems are conceived and brought to scale, what they can safely withstand, and ultimately what renders them vulnerable to failure. And he understands the importance of visionary engineers to improving and iterating upon these systems to create a safer and more equitable world. Whether developing novel software, advising our civil and systems engineering department here at Hopkins or nailing a harmonica solo during one of the many blues concerts he hosts for friends and neighbor and if you at some point want to break out the harmonica now and engage in song that's good but he has always sought to play his part in systems that quite frankly empower others and in everything he does he has sought to ensure that the systems that give meaning and purpose to our daily lives work for and not against the flourishing of those around him. So to Lauren, well, it's uh, still safe to say that we all would have hoped that you would still not be charting the path of the coronavirus uh, in 2022. We are so immensely proud of your dedication to bringing accessible and trustworthy data to the forefront of global vision for a healthier future. Uh, and to Buddy and Sandy, thank you too for your unmatched support of this groundbreaking work and the extraordinary collaborations it has necessitated and inspired across our university, our city, and our world, and for supporting the discovery that we know with Lauren uh, is still to come, and there'll be lots of it. So thank you all, and congratulations again. Thanks, Ed. Thank you very much, President Daniels. I'm now very happy to welcome to the podium Buddy Cleveland. Buddy graduated from Johns Hopkins University in 1972 with a bachelor's degree in operations research and industrial engineering. Uh, after Hopkins, he went on to have a successful career that started at Bechtel and led to the creation of his own company, which was later acquired by Bentley Systems, where Buddy spent the remainder of his career in leadership and as a consultant. During his time at Bechtel, Buddy met his wife of 42 years, Sandy, and they have two sons and three grandchildren. And I had the pleasure of meeting uh, many of your family members and friends at lunch today, uh, and that was truly a pleasure. Uh, your dedication to the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering as well as, well as to the school is inspiring. Uh, I should note that Buddy and Sandy are not only active at Johns Hopkins, but also within their community with several important causes. And we are grateful to you both, Buddy and Sandy, uh, for all you have done. Thank you for creating the Alton and Sandra Cleveland Professorship. I'm so glad that we can be here to celebrate with you. And with that, the podium is yours. Wow. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Dean and the President for all the nice things they said. I'd like to meet that guy. <laughs> Um, so Sandy and I are just incredibly honored and grateful that we're at a position in our lives that, that allowing us to support Hopkins through this professorship. I came to Hopkins as a pretty unsophisticated, uh, very blue collar kid from Rockville, Maryland. Uh, when I graduated, uh, after an academic career that could be generously described as less than stellar, I, uh, I could never imagine that 50 years later, I'd be standing here as part of such a prestigious uh, event. Um, when I say 50 years out loud, it sounds a lot longer than it feels. 
Um, I was fortunate to enjoy a very successful career. And a few years after I retired, I uh, reflected back over the key milestones in that my career and realized that they were all made possible by two things. One was my Hopkins education, and two was the unwavering support from my wife, Sandy. Um, I can honestly say at the heart of every achievement or decision that moved my career forward was something I learned at Hopkins or someone I met at Hopkins. Um, also, uh, along the way, I took a few calculated risks in, with my career and our Sandy in my life, um, it would, but they worked out very well. Um, but I'll tell you, some of them were more than just a little scary. And I'm sure I would have never taken those risks without Sandy's unwavering support and encouragement. She's a bigger gambler than me. Um, so that brings us to today. After establishing the professorship last summer, Sandy and I had a very nice visit from Dean Schlesinger and Kim Willis, who were kind enough to visit us in our home outside of Philadelphia. During that meeting, the Dean said it would be a few weeks before they identified someone for the professorship. Well, less than a week later, uh, Kim called me and said that they were considering Lauren Gardner for the professorship. And how would I, how would I feel about that? Well, I knew who Lauren was, and I was well aware of the work that she and her colleagues had done and, and its global impact. So I tried to remain professional. I calmly said something like, well, that sounds good, and we'll be happy with that choice. But in my head, I'm thinking, holy crap, that's amazing. I can't think of a better choice. Hell yes, we're happy with it. <laughs> in my head. Um, a few weeks later, after the selection was approved by the trustees, we had a very informative and enjoyable Zoom call with Lauren. And we've been looking forward to this day ever since. So you've heard a lot about Lauren already. You'll hear more from the following speakers and from Lauren herself, and I recommend uh, that you read her impressive bio in the program. It takes two pages. Um, so in closing, Sandy and I would just like to extend our sincere thanks to President Daniels, Dean Schlesinger, and so many people in the Whiting School of Engineering for allowing us to take advantage of this incredible opportunity to engage with and support the university. We also look forward to following Lauren's already incredible career for many years to come. So now uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Lori Graham, Lori Graham Brady. I've had the good fortune to collaborate with Lori for a, a number of years as a member of the industry advisory group for the civil and systems engineering department. Lori also serves today as the associate director of the Hopkins Extreme Materials Institute. Lori also has an impressive bio, and she's just another one of the very smart and very busy women here at Hopkins. So with that, thank you very much for being here and turn it over to Lori. Well, thank you, buddy. Um, I'm Lori Granberry, the chair or former chair of civil and systems engineering, and I'm hopefully going to speak reasonably uh, eloquently on behalf of the department and how pleased we've been to work with Lauren. But first, let me say a couple words to Buddy and Sandy, uh, just because we have had the pleasure of working together for, for many years. Um, I don't know, this, um, this is an incredible philanthropic gift. I don't know if the audience knows how much he's given to the department in terms of his energy and time and really just emotional support for the chairs. Um, and he was the chair of our advisory committee for many years and was an invaluable resource to me um, and to Ben before me uh, in driving the department forward. As we became the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering, which was a big change from our traditional civil engineering, he was behind us and supporting us all the way. And that support was huge. Um, on an interpersonal level, he's always wonderful to work with. He's a wonderful person. Uh, Buddy and Sandy as a couple are 
uh, so impressive in their devotion to each other. Um, and I'm still hoping, I realized we had a missed opportunity to have a Buddy Cleveland concert. I wanna hear the harmonica jam. I've seen it on YouTube, but it's just, I don't think it's the same. So I'm hoping that the department can have a good party at some point and we can all be mask free and uh, celebratory. So let me move on to Lauren. So I first met Lauren on a Zoom interview and those who know her will appreciate this. Um, it was a group of us that were sort of filtering down these hundreds of faculty candidates to try to figure out our one. And we talked to Lauren on Zoom from Sydney and she was in pajama pants cross-legged on her bed. And I think fairly quickly mocked American politics, the state of politics in the late 2010s. And um, we thought, we like this woman. I think this is who we want. Um, she's really been uh, you know, tremendous addition to the department and I won't even go to the COVID dashboard yet. Um, when we were thinking about becoming civil and systems engineering, that was a, a fundamental change for us in um, growing what we do, thinking about how systems has a key place in uh, infrastructure and what bigger system is there than the world's infrastructure. And Lauren appealed because, well, she had this background in transportation, which is kind of traditional civil systems kind of work. But then there was this epidemiology and what's, you know, how Hopkins is that? So it seemed like this person that would bring this really interesting mix to the department. Um, I think there were probably a few people that thought at the time, oh, that's funny. That's interesting for a civil engineering department. Um, but we pushed and uh, brought Lauren in and it was, the best move we made, she came in, was it April of 2019? So less than 12 months later, um, really more like nine months later, I think she knew where the restroom was and maybe the names of the staff, but you know, really had just gotten here and COVID hit and the dashboard hit and we all stayed home. And I think it was a huge challenge for most of our junior faculty, our new faculty. Lauren's probably the best counter example of uh, the challenges of COVID for new faculty. So she really has uh, benefited. And I think Hopkins has been the perfect place for that work. So I think it really was a convergence of many things, but this was the right environment for her. It was, um, there's the School of Public Health, there's Beth and the Center for Civic Impact. And, uh, you know, so I think it brought together a lot of strengths that were here, but also Lauren really drove that. and and grew it from nowhere. We were laughing earlier about how you, we saw pictures of um, major government leaders with the COVID dashboard behind them, but there was no federal funding for this particular project when it was developed. It was Johns Hopkins internal startup funding that made this happen. So it truly is a Hopkins uh, innovation and what bigger impact on the world than the COVID dashboard. I mean, it's more than billions, it's more than millions, it's billions of people. Uh, that used it and, and benefited from it. So yeah, I'm really, I'm so pleased to have Lauren here with all of us. Oh, and by the way, in the middle of all this, she actually, she had a baby. So, you know, it's like the person who can do it all. I, don't, I feel like I can never complain again about being busy or multitasking. Uh, it's amazing. So uh, congratulations to Lauren. Thank you to Buddy and Sandy. Um, and I'm, like to close by introducing our next speaker, Beth Blauer, who's the Associate Vice Provost for the Public Sector, Executive Director for Centers for Civic Impact at Johns Hopkins. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much uh, to the Cleveland family. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet some of your family and, um, and, and to meet uh, the Clevelands. Um, and so thank you so much. I felt so honored to be included today. Uh, thank you to Dean Schlesinger uh, for also including me and the entire Whiting team who has really made me also feel like one of the team. Um, but I would like to especially thank President Daniels um, because it was you who led me to this woman um, who has taught me so much about, sorry, who has taught me so much about ambition and leadership and doing good for others at very high costs. 
Um, it was most importantly a part of me um, because you have led me to someone who I really now consider to be my family. Um, she, um, just to give you a little bit of the backstory, it was late winter 2020, um, and I was deciding actually whether to go on an international trip. And I discovered an unknown colleague who was curating one of the most essential data resources framing this nascent disease um, that was evolving in China. And I innocently reached out, very innocently, uh, reached out to our um, uh, mutual friend, Dr. Lainey Rutko, and explaining to her that I thought, I saw this data set and I think there was something that maybe I could do to help. And within hours, I received a call from President Daniels who insisted that I meet Lauren right away, which, as you've heard, was no easy task. I believe he said something like, I can't believe you haven't met yet. You're like sisters that were separated at birth. And after some light stalking from me on my end, I was uh, um, finally able to get Dr. Gardner to accept my call. And the rest, as they say, is history. Our story is actually a quintessential Hopkins story. It's a story of um, two women woven together um, by two women woven together, two smart people motivated by making our time on this earth count, brought together by leaders who see beyond silos and give us the freedom to explore, think critically, and govern a resource that has guided the world in one of the most untethered times of our history. Our one call led to another call, led to to another call. And for the last two plus years, I don't think a day has gone by where Lauren and I haven't been in contact. Calls turned into our famous walks through campus and the surrounding communities. And I learned so much about Lauren in those early days. I learned that Lauren is motivated deeply by the desire to make the world a better place with no hyperbole at all. Her motivation is deeply rooted in her belief in science and its capacity to solve society's hardest problems. From disease to infrastructure to our social safety net, Lauren brings a perspective that is the perfect blend of engineering and social responsibility. Lauren is a pragmatist with a cutting sense of humor and an intellect that is not only pronounced on the surface, but lives deeply in everything that she does. Lauren is also a low key proud Texan, even when she is deeply disappointed in her leaders. Lauren is incredibly devoted daughter with parents who have poured themselves into every aspect of who she is. And Lauren is the loving wife and, of Alex and mother to both Isla and Tim Tam. We frequently joke that we made the CRC and a baby in 2020, <laughs> and the jury is still out on which one will have more lasting impact on our world. But there's no denying that Alex is Isla and uh, is, uh, Alex, uh, Isla is Alex and Alex is Lauren and Baltimore is a fair, better city for having you both here with us. Alex, thank you for the sacrifices, the late nights, and everything you have done to make this work soar. There are plenty of us here today that can talk about Dr. Gardner's scholarship, her research, and her impact. But today, I introduce you to my friend, and a friend who has weathered the storm right by my side at a time when most humans are emerging from a period in our shared history that's actually marked by deep isolation and social exclusion, we emerge together with a bright future and a promise that holds to this day. There is no one more deserving of this honor, and I am so proud to be here to welcome you into this esteemed position. And so without further ado, I invite my friend and my closest colleague, Dr. Lauren Gardner, to the stage. I should have invited you to do my introduction. Now I have to follow that. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you, Buddy and Beth, obviously, and Lori and Ron and Ed. Um, I really don't want to have to follow all of these speeches, and we should probably just go eat cake now. But I think that there are some things I'd like to say and some things I'd like to share. I opted to do this without slides as well, which I learned is how most people do this, but I think, and it goes against all of my urges as a professor to just talk um, without slides, but I think it'd be a nice change of pace. And I really honestly was excited to give another, give 
a talk without pictures of the dashboard for once. So um, this will be great. Um, but I think first and foremost, I just have want to say thanks. Uh, there's no way I would be here at JHU or um, here in this room if it weren't for so many people that are here today and some that are not here today as well. Um, thank you, Buddy and Sandra, for selecting me to be the inaugural professorship under your name. It's really an honor, and the recognition and the opportunity is amazing. Um, I will do my best to set a good precedent for all the future professors for the next you know, 500 years as that has taught us that will follow under your name. I won't be inventing calculus, but I will see what I can do. Um, I also wanna thank all my department colleagues, um, especially Lori for her relentless effort in getting me here from Sydney to Baltimore through what was a somewhat longer than usual professional dating period, we'll say. Um, and for all of my colleagues for being so welcoming as soon as I joined and even before that time. Um, I'm very excited to be inching back to a time where we can actually be working together in the same physical space and nice new fancy offices at that. Um, and then I have to thank Ed and Ron for all of the and your teams for all of the time and resources that you have provided and graciously offered over the last couple of years. Um, it's no doubt enabled us to keep the dashboard alive and functioning um, and evolved to the beast that it is today. Uh, I give talks all the time about the dashboard work and every time I present, I have to just over highlight how critical it was that we did this work in such a supportive environment. And there's no way that this would ever have existed if we didn't have the support of the university behind us, uh, especially in those first few days. Um, I think that um, that really got us through those first months and then enabled us to build the infrastructure in the years since and I think most importantly as well creating what will be a priceless resource for future research and understanding COVID and other infectious diseases for researchers for years to come. So speaking of that dashboard, I cannot remind people enough that this this has only been as successful as it has because of a large group of people, much broader than just myself, that have been working so diligently. And most of them were working behind the scenes. I think that these individuals get way less credit for all the work that they've done than they deserve, and I get too much. Um, this group includes, but is not limited to Frank, of course, for pioneering this effort from the start. And as a first year PhD student, um, as we said, on my startup funds and staying so committed to maintaining it every single day since. So Frank, thank you. Um, and also for the other CSSE students that had so many late night coding sessions and data scrambling in those early days where we had no resources or formal structure with this, I was, you know, um, calling in on our department colleagues for any PhD students that they had that they could spare for a few minutes here and there. Um, and that really got us through, I think, those that critical time. Um, we definitely couldn't have done this without the APL team, the data wizards, as we call them, who were led by Aaron and Tamara and have worked around the clock for more than two years to help develop and maintain the infrastructure that supports this. Uh, I'm still not convinced that a lot of the members of the APL team are not robots, but, and it doesn't help that I still have actually not met any of them but one, um, but we'll see. Um, I also wanna thank the whole CRC team. So Beth Laney, who I don't think is here, who I also haven't yet met and might be a robot, um, who led the teams and the storytelling around this data. And on that topic, and I also don't think they're here is the comms teams from the university, from the school that have supported this effort and helped contextualize and communicate on the data and all of its flaws to the public and to the media on our behalf. And they, I think in my, in my opinion, have served as critical of a role as the data itself through this effort. Um, 
and they've helped us really navigate some challenging situations with so much diplomacy and more than I think I could ever have done. Um, and then on this too, uh, you'll have to tell Mary that I say thanks. For those of you that haven't had this kind of experience or been in this stage, a good project manager is just priceless. And the person that keeps you on track through meetings and makes sure that things get done that need to get done. Um, and so there's just no way we would have ever pulled this off without this amazing group of individuals um, and their teams. And then critically, the trusted reputation of this university where all of this lived behind. Um, I think, you know, this was something Frank had an idea, I made it a reality, and this huge group of people kept it alive and healthy and functioning along the way. So I just can't thank them enough for all of their contributions. So besides the dashboard, in addition to collecting data, I also very much like to use data was the motivation behind doing it in the first place. And so on that note, I also want to thank my students and the whole lab group. Um, I know it's been a long couple of years and a lot of hard work and very less than ideal uh, working conditions and environment. Uh, but there's no question that the work you guys have done has really moved the state of the art in public health response and modeling of infectious diseases. And so it's been incredibly rewarding and exciting and fun to get to work with all of you on what you've been doing. Um, and really also getting to participate on both sides of the fence. Both, we obviously provide this data resource, but then get to utilize this data resource and be part of this modeling community of you know, researchers and practitioners that are moving decisions and, and policy. Um, I've learned a lot from working with each of you over the last couple of years, and I very much continue each to educate me until I allow you to graduate in a few years' time. Um, thank you, Beth, for just being awesome. Uh, for reasons that I don't really understand, you are always a tireless advocate for me and everything that I do, and have really made the last couple of years feel equally like play and work, which is amazing. Ron, I'm sure you've done a lot of really great, important things in your life, but I'm pretty confident that you introducing Beth and I is your greatest achievement. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and yes, Beth does tell everyone that she is the co-parent of my child. Um, and as she highlighted in Lori, that I grew both a map and a human in 2020. It was a busy year. Um, but I do also want to thank Isla's other parent, Alex. Uh, there's no way I would be here if it wasn't for him. Uh, he supports and encourages me to pursue pretty much every opportunity that I express an interest in. This is a lot of things. Um, and even when that opportunity requires him to do things like move from our Ocean View apartment in Sydney to our less than Ocean View apartment in Baltimore. Um, so thank you, Alex, for all that you have done. And I'm still very sorry that after all that you have done, Tim Tam, our puppy, is the one that got named credit in the Wall Street Journal, and you were just referenced as husband. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I am also incredibly lucky and grateful for the family and friends that I have, um, especially my parents and sister, who, as Beth highlighted, always encouraged me and humored my inquisitive nature. Um, I grew up in a very science-minded household, and that experience instilled in me a deep appreciation for rational and evidence-based thought. And though it is possible my parents now regret this because I don't really let them or anyone get away with the logical comments in conversation, um, but it's no question a huge part of who I am. And I'm very lucky to have friends that are also so supportive of these characteristics, um, or at least put up with them. Uh, one of my favorite stories on this is when I finished my PhD, a couple girlfriends of mine gave me a necklace with the initial Y on it, which has nothing to do with any part of my name, but they said it was because I asked so many questions. Um, and then amazingly, this story actually made it to a Time reporter last year that was doing a profile piece on me. Um, and I just really chalk up to really good investigative journalism. But Beth, you remember Emily? She did spend over a year writing that article, so I guess it's fair that she found all corners. Um, so I really could continue with thank yous for another 20 minutes. I'm not going to do that. Um, given why we're here, I do want to talk a little bit about my professional um, 
career path and which in a nutshell pretty much comes down to the fact that I have commitment issues and get excited about way too many things. Um, so I when, since I began at university, I strategically chose a path that would never pigeonhole me into any kind of constrained job. And so I didn't always know what I wanted to do, but I did know that I wanted to stay in school forever, which I still highly recommend everybody doing. Um, and I remember when my friends were graduating and leaving and taking jobs and making money, I just thought they were crazy and didn't understand why anyone would wanna do that and not go to graduate school. And so I started a PhD and I chose to study network modeling because to me, I always appreciated how these seemingly very disparate systems uh, were connected and I thought that this expertise would allow me to work on whatever problems I found interesting. And I still claim I can make every problem a network problem, as if you've taken my class, you know, and hopefully are convinced is true. If you're not, try me, I will do it. Um, as a PhD student, I was in a transportation group in the civil engineering department at UT Austin, and they did work on a lot of pretty traditional traffic engineering related topics, which I loved the group, but these topics didn't really excite me. And so I opted to do my PhD on applying network theory to understand how transportation or mobility systems um, impacted epidemiological systems. At the time, I didn't actually know anybody that had done anything on this or really know anything about it, um, but it just was a topic that clicked with me. And amazingly, my advisor, who also had never worked in this space, uh, allowed me to just go with it. To his credit, he did introduce me to someone that did know things about this. Uh, that was a biologist, Sahotra Sarkar, also at Texas, who also happened to be a computer scientist and a philosopher. Um, and so he really helped me keep my work on track and bridge these different disciplines. And this line of interdisciplinary work that bridges and utilizes mathematical modeling for public health applications has really remained central to my research to this day. Um, and Sohotra has also remained a mentor and a close colleague since. So after my graduation, uh, after my PhD graduation, I took a position at University of New South Wales in Sydney. So I figure Alex at least owes me for that one because uh, I did take him along with me. And I continued this stream of research bridging transportation and, and public health. Um, but there I was again, as I even was at UT, a bit of an outcast in the civil engineering department. They didn't have anyone working on this space. And within the first couple of years, I brought in the first NHMRC, which is Australia's NIH, basically, um, the first grant from this, um, uh, this government authority that they had gotten in the department in like 40 years. So I figured I was doing something right. And um, while I was there, I did start building closer ties with the School of Public Health and working with students and colleagues there on developing new theoretical tools for infectious disease related problems and it was great and i loved living in sydney but after a few years of doing this i just started to feel like there was a cap on the impact that i could have while i was there and so there, it was around this time that there was a new ad for this new position at the malone center here um, and that got circulated to me by a few different people that just thought it seemed like the perfect fit because there's just not a ton of engineers out there um, working on public health applications. And of course, what better place to have this interest and in this, you know, connecting expertise than, than at Hopkins. Um, at the time, I was still pretty happy living in Sydney and Hopkins and moving was not actually even on my radar, uh, but I, in fact, I clearly remember saying when I got the ad that I would never apply because there was no way I would ever move to Baltimore. Um, side note, I had never been to Baltimore and this was completely based on my naive perception of the city, watching too many wire episodes and the fact that you were on the East Coast and had a real winter, which I was very afraid of as a Texan living in Australia. Um, I eventually got convinced to apply by both a colleague, a very selfless colleague actually, and Alex as well. And soon, soon after that, got introduced to Case through a Zoom interview. Um, and that interview was just eye-opening. I immediately felt like Hopkins was a place that I would fit perfectly, which in hindsight is because 
case is really just a department of a bunch of other outcast professors that don't fit a typical mold of civil engineers, and they provide a very welcoming home for this type of person. Um, and so my Zoom interview was, was soon followed by a trip from Sydney to Baltimore for an in-person um, interview, where I, which I brought Alex along to. The whole way, of course, I was still thinking that I would hate the city and never move to Baltimore. Um, but we got here and the interview went great. I loved everything about it. I remember going back to the hotel on a total high and I was like, how am I gonna tell Alex we might actually have to move to Baltimore? Um, meanwhile, he had been wandering around the wrong parts of the city by himself in the cold and rain all day. So I'll just say we were not equally excited about the prospect. Um, but as always, he was on board. And for a few different reasons, um, I ended up joining about two years after that interview took place in a different capacity than the one I had originally applied for. Um, but even though it took a while, I just I stayed really excited about the opportunity the whole time because I just knew this was a place where I could come and have the opportunity to translate the research that I was doing into practice and hopefully make a real impact. So my first day at Hopkins was March 1. Um, it was a weird start date. Moving from Australia is complicated and seasons and school cycles. And secretly, I actually hoped that this was strategic and meant I would miss winter. It was snowing the day that we drove in, so, so much for that planning. Um, but otherwise, it was very smooth sailing getting started and just everyone was incredibly welcoming and it was a really great experience. Um, after I got here, I soon got to meet Ed for the first time, and we had a great coffee date meeting at Bird in Hand, which is still perhaps my favorite coffee shop in the city. Um, and we talked about all sorts of problems facing society and all the cutting edge work that was being done here and elsewhere to address these. Um, and we chatted for an hour. And at the end of that talk, I remember him asking me, is there anything else that you want to ask? And I said, is there something else I'm supposed to ask? He said, usually people use these meetings with me to ask me what they have to do to get tenure. And I said, oh, I was like, well, that sounds like a way less interesting conversation. <laughs> um, I didn't really come here to get tenure. I just came here to do things that I thought were exciting and important. Um, I hope these align. And, uh, and he said that that's absolutely the right attitude. And, um, Though he did tell me that, or he did warn me that if I wanted to work in this interdisciplinary space that I had described outside of the kind of traditional academic community that I came from, it's fine, but I better be a shining star. So being a shining star wasn't exactly my objective either, um, but I definitely did have my share of the spotlight in the short time that I was here. Um, while it kind of seems like a lifetime ago, the COVID dashboard was actually not the first time that my research was on the Hopkins homepage and went viral in, in the media. Um, this was actually, and amazingly, another project of Frank's and mine together, um, was actually my work on mapping vaccine hesitancy and resulting measles risk in the US, which is still a big problem, um, but one that unfortunately kind of got pushed to the side for the last couple of years, and we're coming back to this now. Um, so, when this happened, there was news articles popping up left and right on CNN. And I remember at the time thinking like, man, I just got here. This is the pinnacle of my career. What am I gonna do next that's ever gonna get more attention than this? Um, and so coincidentally, this was actually the topic of the meeting that Frank and I were having when we pivoted to a discussion about these new novel pneumonia cases that were popping up in China and made the decision to start um, tracking and openly sharing this data and visualizing it. So I think we all know the rest of that story, so I'm just gonna skip to the present. Um, so while there's a million things about the work that we've done over the last couple of years that I'm immensely proud of, I think the thing that to me is the most meaningful is the role that we played in educating and translating science to the public. Uh, when we started this effort in January, we, of course, did not know the scale that COVID would evolve to. Um, but at the time, we understood the importance of science and data. And in this current age of misinformation, democratized data and science communication is critical for, at least with the respect to public health, two main reasons. One is so the general public can make informed decisions um, for themselves regarding their own personal health. 
and the second is to enable evidence-based public health policy. And given the amount of COVID misinformation and circulation and highly politicized nature of this public health crisis, I think that the work we did enabled individuals to access the information they needed to make informed decisions, protect themselves. And this was especially critical in those kind of locations where, where there was delayed and non-existent policies. Um, and being from Texas, I can definitely say this, as far as I can discern, I'm pretty sure they think they could use their guns and shoot the virus away. Um, so through some of our complimentary, and I think what's really cool is again, alongside doing this data collection, we were using it and studying these problems. And through some of the research that we conducted, we actually saw direct evidence for this. We actually showed that by observing these behavioral changes, that they were actually happening before policies were implemented in multiple different locations around the country. And I think that this really speaks to the value of our work and the fact that this information was, was used being directly by individuals to make decisions and adapt their behavior when they weren't being forced to do so. Um, moving forward, I'm really excited about so many different opportunities here um, and building on our learnings over the last few years. Um, and transferring that knowledge, as was mentioned, to lots of other problems that are facing societies. These are all network problems grounded in civil infrastructure systems, human-centric with deep-rooted inequities, and demand data-driven solutions. I'm particularly excited to continue with the central theme of my work over the last few years um, and a just long-standing interest, which is to better understand how human behavior impacts large-scale systems, and in particular, focusing on the harms posed by misinformation, uh, which we all know is rampant. And I'm really excited about the opportunities to address these challenges with Beth and both of our teams. There's um, about a million project ideas on this that I would love to chat more with all of you on, but I will leave that for the reception. Um, and I think in closing, I just wanna reiterate that the opportunities I've been given over the last two years have been unbelievable and really a direct result of the hard work by so many colleagues and other people at this institution. Uh, most scientists wouldn't even get to dream about being a part of something so big and so impactful, and it's truly been an exceptional experience to be a part of one. And also, amazingly, while getting to work in such a supportive, collegial, and friendly environment. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much.